Dear colleagues and friends, it's time to start the next extremely provocative session. I am happy to announce that we have a session which is based on the advances of personalized medicine in psychiatry. And it is also my honor to announce the moderator, Mr. Russell Amato from Genomind. Genomind is uh, one of our most valued partners in NM Genomics. We work excellent. We have excellent best practices with them. And I have no doubts that this session will be extremely interesting and provocative. Russell, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so what we'll do, thank you everybody, by the way, for having us. Uh, we're going to start, uh, obviously, this panel is on psychiatry and pharmacogenetics and personalized practice. I am, as you mentioned, Dr. Russell Amato. I'm a senior medical science liaison at Genomine. Uh, Genomine, just so you guys are aware, we're a personalized medicine platform. We focus on pharmacogenomics, and we try to bring innovation to healthcare around the world. Right? We're currently testing in over 30 countries. We're compromised of pioneering scientists, thought leaders in psychiatry, neurology, and genetics, and we deliver actionable insights to clinicians, healthcare partners, and individuals, patients, to improve quality of human life. Now, our first speaker, Dr. Seema Patel, is also a medical science liaison at Genomine. She earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. Post-graduation, she completed two years of residency a PGY-1 pharmacy practice residency at Carolina Medical Center and a PGY-2 psychiatric pharmacy residency at Virginia Commonwealth. Her experiences largely focused on performing psychiatric interviews, treatment assessment, and evidence-based recommendations on multidisciplinary rounds, teaching lectures at the VCU School of Pharmacy, and performing drug utilization reviews and order verifications on psychiatric patient care services. Prior to joining our team here at Genomine, she worked as a clinical psychiatric pharmacist at Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates, and she has worked with treating patients with psychiatric disorders. She is a board-certified psychiatric pharmacist. Now, at Genomine, she uses her expertise in pharmacogenetics and psychopharmacology to provide clinical consultations for pharmacogenetic test result interpretation to providers treating patients with mental health conditions. She's also responsible for enhancing and updating our technological platforms here at Genomine and improving pharmacogenetic tests to improve the delivery of mental health care. Uh, she'll go ahead and take you through a lot of the basics and the backgrounds of uh, pharmacogenomics now. And so Dr. Patel, take it away, feel free. Thank you, Dr. Amato. I'm gonna go ahead and pop over my screen here. And just give me a thumbs up if things look okay. All right, um, so thanks for the introduction. I'm very excited and happy to be starting off this panel here today, providing, you know, I have about, I think, 10 minutes to uh, tell you as much as possible about the evidence of pharmacogenics and psychiatry. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of hit the home run highlights for you all here today. And I always start off my conversation with where are we currently with treatment without looking at pharmacogenetics? What is kind of the typical approach? And I always use STARDI trial as a uh, reference for this because many of us are familiar about this trial. It is a huge landmark trial in uh, major depressive disorder. And they had patients undergo a stepwise treatment approach the first treatment trial in STARDI was an SSRI, which is what you see here on the left side, are the remission rates and intolerance rates for citalopram in this case. And what we can see here is that after just the first trial of an SSRI, in this case citalopram, only 37% of patients achieved remission. So two thirds of patients have yet to really achieve remission after their first trial. And we can see with every subsequent treatment that remission rate goes down while intolerance rates increase. So whenever I look at STARDI, I know it as a, kind of a, a marker of, you know, what is going on here in terms of why are we only seeing 30 to 37 percent of patients remitting on their first SSRI? It's probably a number of different factors uh, that are involved here, but maybe pharmacogenics can explain in part uh, why we see such low remission rates. 
And we know that in psychiatry, this one size fits all approach does not work well. Uh, we have to be able to more specifically uh, target the right medications uh, for the right patients. And pharmacogenics can help us get there. Um, it helps us to assess how genetic variations can affect a person's response to medications. This could be because of a variation in a metabolism pathway. Maybe they're a fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer, and that's affecting their efficacy or their intolerance rates. Um, are there different receptor targets or me mechanisms that are different that are resulting in different response to medications? What kind of drug drug interactions exist that could be impacting uh, side effects and efficacy, as well as lifestyle impact and um, gene drug interactions we'll talk about um, briefly. But this uh, take home here is really we we're trying to move forward from this trial and error approach to really going forward and personalizing medicine and individualizing treatment um, so that we are better able to give patients the best chance of finding a medication that's going to work for them. When it comes to the different types of genes that we look at, uh, it's kind of two big umbrellas, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic. Now, what you see here on the left side are our pharmacokinetic genes. And the ones in the middle here, um, you might have been familiar with previously, in part because they are heavily involved with the metabolism of most medications, including psychiatric medications. And these can impact the rate of metabolism. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, the, in, a pre, in an upcoming slide. And then ABCB1 genes can influence drug absorption or how much drug is getting into the brain. And that, of course, can also inevitably impact overall drug exposure. So this can provide us information, um, you know, preemptively even, whether somebody is going to be at a higher risk of side effects because they're a slower metabolizer or at a higher risk of inefficacy if they're a faster metabolizer. Um, so we can already see how we can start to tailor medications just looking at pharmacokinetic genes alone. Now, when we're combining this with understanding pharmacodynamic genes, all of these involve um, different receptors or mechanisms that are targets for uh, many of the medications that we use in psychiatry. And these can influence our drug response what is the probability of drug response for this patient? Is it higher? Is it lower? Right? These are just probability estimates. They're not deterministic, but it's giving us a, a better idea of, um, you know, if I start this person on an SSRI, uh, what is the chance that this medication is actually going to work for treating their depression? And really the bulk of the next few slides is going to be talking about where does the evidence come from? How can we use pharmacogenetic information most responsibly and most in line with these different guideline resources? And there are a number of them, um, FDA, uh, CPIC, DPWG, and PharmGKB. I'll be highlighting uh, FDA and CPIC uh, more closely, but um, all of these have different recommendations. Some of them are actionable. And the FDA has over 270 medications with some type of uh, precaution. Uh, precaution related to pharmacogenetics um, or a dosing guidance, uh, a warning in the labeling, and that biomarkers table uh, will provide that information. More recently, they've created a table of pharmacogenetic associations, which they believe to have the highest level of evidence for pharmacogenetic guidance, um, and that was more so in conversations with CPIC. So um, we're kind of moving ahead with more uh, guide, guidance coming from the FDA and more um, uh, development in some of these tables that they are providing. The Clinical Pharmacogenics Implementation Consortium is a group of researchers that have peer-reviewed published guidelines on a number of different psychiatric medications. These include SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, um, ADHD medications like atomoxetine, and we really use these uh, this information whenever we get a pharmacogenic test result back to understand are there specific dosing guidance recommendations, for example, are there in some cases medications I should avoid, um, you know, based on the guidance provided from CPIC. Same thing with our Euro the European counterpart, Dutch Pharmacogenics Working Group. They too also have published. Uh, guidelines with a number of different psychiatric medications. A lot of them are actionable dosing recommendations. And then last but not least, 
Uh, FarmGKB, all of these, by the way, are publicly available. FarmGKB is a fantastic NIH database that allows you to uh, type in a gene and understand the um, studies that have been looked at for that gene drug association. What is the level of evidence? Um, what ethnicities was this um, gene studied in so that you can better understand um, extrapolation for some of these gene drug associations? The next slide, two slides that I have up here are just for illustrative purposes, um, just to show you, uh, you know, for CYP2C19, which is a, a gene involved with drug metabolism of many psychiatric medications. This is all of the organizations that I just talked about in one table, just showing you that um, all of these have some type of dosing guidance with these medications that we use in psychiatry that are impacted by CYP2C19. 2D6 far more medications as you can see here. And you can see here that a lot of these are actionable um, and they have a level of evidence in farm GKB, uh, dosing recommendations, um, either the FDA label and DPWG or CPIC. What you will notice though from this is that yes, there are some gaps in uh, recommendations for some of these medications. CPIC is working on some guidelines for SNRIs and some other classes of medications. But I think one of the things that will really help the field of pharmacogenetics, it will be harmonization between all of these different groups. And I think that there are, are more conversations being had to harmonize some of these uh, pharmacogenetic guidelines. But regardless, if you're getting pharmacogenetic testing, we should be using them um, responsibly and in line with any type of dosing recommendation or guidance provided by um, any of these four organizations. Now that I've kind of talked to you, uh, you know, a little bit about all the organization, I just want to take a deep dive into uh, some of the highlights. So I mentioned the FDA. I just wanted to show you what some of these um, recommendations will look like or how they will show up on the labeling. Um, I mentioned earlier about those metabolism genes. And what you can see here on the left side is just a, a AUC um, a drug exposure curve based on your uh, metabolism. So. Obviously, the standard here is the um, extensive metabolizer or normal metabolizer. And then up above, we have our patients who are slower metabolizers who are going to be at a higher risk of side effects because they're not clearing the medication as they should, or they're rapid metabolizer and therefore have decreased or um, below therapeutic level, subtherapeutic levels because of a faster metabolism. In this case, the risk would be inefficacy. And this all translates into, um, you know, re recommendations um, from the FDA for certain medications for aripiprazole or Abilify uh, for patients who are 2D6 poor metabolizers, they fall over here, right? High area under the curve, high drug exposure. The labeling will actually say use half of the usual dose. So they recognize that there's going to be increased drug exposure here. Um, we can be proactive about this by starting off with half of the usual dose just to be safer. Um, in some cases, like citalopram, the labeling will have a maximum dose because there is a risk of dose-dependent QT prolongation. And somebody who is a 2C19 for metabolizer, they're going to experience 20 milligrams of citalopram, something more like 40 milligrams. And therefore, there is a maximum here uh, to reduce that risk of QT prolongation. So these are just some of the examples among many of um, how the FDA will include some dosing guidance for us and um, uh, provide some recommendations if we're getting pharmacogenic testing for our patients. Um, just really quickly here for uh, CPIC guidelines, um, I've provided some examples here, so uh, you can take a look on your own time. These are publicly available again, so um, SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, carbamazepine, all of these have published guidelines. Um, that will provide dosing recommendations based on your uh, genetic results. This is just a snapshot of an example. If you were taking citalopram or escitalopram or thinking about prescribing it for a patient, um, they provide the implications as well as a recommendation based on your phenotype. So I mentioned in the last slide that the FDA recommends, um, you know, a maximum dose for citalopram. And then CPIC will uh, have similar recommendations of considering a 50% reduction or considering something else that doesn't go through this pathway, right? 
but they also provide recommendations if you're an ultra rapid metabolizer and are breaking that down that drug very quickly, they will say consider an alternative medication. So I just wanted to highlight these two here to show you how um, you can apply these to the real world uh, once you're getting testing results back um, and we can really individualize and make our treatment decisions more tailored towards the patient by incorporating this into our practice. Now that I've covered uh, all these organizations that have PGX guidance, how does this translate into clinical outcomes? Are there studies that have looked at pharmacogenetic guided care and shown that this has resulted in improved outcomes? I'm gonna share some of those um, meta-analyses right now. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis um, of about 1,700 patients um, with depression. And, uh, and the uh, overall outcome here was that patients who received pharmacogenetic guided treatment were 71% more likely to achieve symptom remission for depression compared to patients who just received treatment as usual. So pharmacogenetic guided care uh, resulted in improved outcomes in patients with depression uh, based on this meta-analysis by Bowsman. More recently, we have, um, there's been a publication um, for uh, pharmacogenetics and how the effect will be on hospitalizations as well as a number of medication changes. So what you're looking at here are some of the forest plots. Uh, up top, we can see here that patients who received, who received pharmacogenetic guided care were 91% more likely to have medication changes compared to patients who received normal treatment. And this was uh, because of medication optimization, a dose um, switch, a medication switch, a dose change, or deprescribing. Furthermore, they looked at hospitalizations, uh, a number of different studies here, and overall, patients who received pharmacogenetic guided care were 50% more likely to, um, or 50% less likely, sorry, to be hospitalized compared to patients who uh, received treatment as usual. So we see increased medication changes because of dose optimization, medication optimization, and we see reduced hospitalizations in patients who are receiving pharmacogenetic care. So I just wanted to kind of leave this off with, you know, we've really come a long way or, uh, you know, really exciting um, time when it comes to how far pharmacogenetic evidence um, is. And I think only the future uh, pharmacogenic research will grow stronger. It's a really exciting time to be in pharmacogenetics and psychiatry. Um, and I was just glad to be able to share with you um, this more recent meta-analysis that was very exciting to see um, in the publications. And I will uh, put it back to you, Dr. Amato, or leave it up, leave it to the next uh, guest speaker um, to, to talk about their um, presentation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christina Ruseva, hopefully I pronounced that appropriately, uh, graduated university in Plovdiv with a degree in medicine in 2014. From 2015 to 16, she worked as a general medical practitioner in Plovdiv, as well as working in the emergency medical service department at the medical center hypothalamus. Um, since October of 2017, she's been specializing in psychiatry at University Hospital St. George, again, probably my English translation, uh, in Plovdiv, where she diagnosed and actively treated patients with mental illness. In 2019, Dr. Ruseva began working at Saints Cosmos and Damien, a private clinic for mental health alongside Dr. Markov, and has begun her training in psychotherapy. She has three years of training in psychoanalysis and has completed courses in evolutionary and cross-cultural psychology and psychiatry in order to pursue her interest in the field of positive psychotherapy. In addition, from September 2020 to August 2021, she's been on the front line at COVID-19 hospital wards in St. George. Today, she's going to be discussing a case study in which she uses PGX testing to help tailor a patient's drug regimen to their DNA. So yes, Dr. Ruseva, if you'd like to take over and go ahead and share your screen, you can uh, start your presentation now. Thank you, Dr. Amato. Um... Yeah, I will start with my presentation. Um, I would like to say if you can see my screen already. Um, not yet. Not yet. Um, give me a second, then I will see. Okay. 
Yep, now we can see it, um, but it's not in, oh, there we go. Now it's in presentation mode. You're good to go. Okay, thank you. So I'm presenting now a clinical case of a patient with depression and panic disorder. It's a patient from the practice where I work with Dr. Markov. Um, so this patient, here's the story, uh, some demography and uh, premorbid development history. She's 32 years old, married woman uh, with one child. She has a higher degree in accountancy and controlling. She was born from the second pregnancy that was full term and without any complications of birth. She had a normal neuromotor development, graduated university with master's degree. She got married at the age of 27 and gave birth at the age of 30. Medical and family history of the patient. She has no past or present illnesses. Mother and sister with panic disorder who are treated with estelopram successfully and are both currently in remission. She has a father with uh, alcohol abuse in the past. She says uh, that she smokes half a pack of uh, cigarettes per day and she lives in good conditions in a harmonic relationship with her husband and her child. So the history of her mental illness starts about five years ago when she was 27. Four months after the marriage, she got pregnant, but the pregnancy has complications and there was an abortion required for medical reasons. This had a severe impact on her mental state. The day after the abortion, she had her first panic attack with palpitations, nausea, sweating and sweating and strong fear, which made her go to the emergency room. There, uh, her, her condition was taken under control, but uh, since then she felt depressed with uh, negative thoughts about life, felt fear and uh, no desire for anything. Soon after that, the symptoms came back and she suffered periodically from panic attacks. After some time, she consulted a psychiatrist who prescribed her therapy with acetylopram, 10 milligrams per day. The treatment had effect, but there was no complete remission. And after one year of, treat, of treating with uh, taking acetylopram, she started to take also Atarax, 25 milligrams per day. And that was added for, uh, to the therapy exactly because she didn't have complete disappearance of the symptoms. And she took it for one more year together with acetylopram. And then she, that's the moment when she got pregnant for a second time. And then she decided to stop the treatment. But the pregnancy was so difficult for her. She was suffering with uh, severe anxiety and depressed mood and nausea. During the, the sixth lunar month, she consulted the psychiatrist again. She was prescribed therapy with probiotics because then, back then she didn't want to take any other uh, medications. And after giving birth, she became depressed. She was uh, without appetite, uh, she couldn't sleep well. She has constantly uh, anxiety and panic attacks. And then treatment was started with uh, triticum, 75 uh, milligrams tablets. And it was, uh, the dose was up to one and one third tablets per day in the evening and the oxygen 30 milligrams. And after the first month, the dose was increased to 60 milligrams, but without a satisfactory effect. Then after the discussion with the psychiatrist, a pharmacogenical test was performed. After reviewing the results, the oxygen was replaced with fluoxetine, uh, Prozac, 20 milligrams per day. And, subse and subsequently, uh, it was raised to 40 milligrams per day and uh, also worzepam was given on an as-needed basis. After less than three months on this therapy, the patient reported that her mental condition has significantly improved, her night's sleep and appetite were not disturbed anymore, she had no panic attacks and she was not that anxious. Currently, she is looking for a job in her specialty because after two months her motherhood ends and she intends on start working again. And I want to just show the results of her pharmacogenetic test 
that are showing the, the part of depression summary that are showing which antidepressants are uh, the best choice, are the guided options in her case. And um, that's why also the doctor chose for this antidepressant and uh, they could see the result coming very shortly after that. And as a conclusion, um, I would say that um, in this case, we see that the genetic testing is emerging as a scientific way to guide the selection of the optimum treatment regime for the patient. It is another example of how being aware of a patient's genetic profile may help find the optimal prescription and the dose with fewer trial and error attempts, and so to lead to faster remission of the symptoms. And of course, this can also lower the cost. Uh, in general for the patient itself because we know that as long she or he the patient is suffering from the condition they cannot go to work so this means more uh inability and of course this is all connected also with the with the cost and of course no one's nobody wants to prolong the suffering and with this i say thank you for the attention. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Useva. Um, let's see. It looks like our next panelist, unfortunately, is a little bit under the weather. Uh, Mr. Peter Shelpov is one of our medical science liaison colleagues there at NM Genomics there in Bulgaria. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to that illness, he will not be presenting today. So we're probably going to move on to Mr. Simon Spicek. Uh, hopefully, again, uh, I pronounce that appropriately. Um, Mr. Spicek is a neuroscientist. He earned his master's at University College Cork, uh, looking at interactions between microbially produced metabolites in the gut and brain, and is an author in several scientific papers in the field. He's also a 2020 Fame Lab Ireland champion and a science journalist with pieces published across Being Patient, Biospace, Massive Science, RTE Brainstorm and Futurism. He is currently the co-founder of a mental health startup in Canada called Resolve that aims to provide integrated therapy solutions for high school and university students. And in addition, he provides consulting and scientific writing services for several clients. He will be talking about the importance of access to mental health resources for people and the teletherapy industry landscape uh, today. Mr. Spicek? Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And let me just share the screen. Yeah. Is everyone able to see? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about why there's still a youth mental health problem. So we've heard some fascinating talks about pharmacogenetics and how that can be used to find the ideal treatment. Uh, but that doesn't mean that students don't have issues with their mental health anymore. So let's dig a little deeper into that. I recently finished off my master's in science at University College Cork. And along the way, I realized I was having my own mental health issues and that there were also a lot of really big limitations in the types of support that could be offered by universities abroad and also at home in Canada. Well, what's the issue? So uh, this is, a lot of these numbers are from before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, two thirds of students felt stressed about their grades, uh, four and five uh, felt overwhelm and then during the pandemic about three and four young adults reported mental health or substance use struggles and more than one in four students seriously contemplated suicide so these numbers are huge and i'm sure a lot of people in the audience have had their own issues with mental health and i think it's really important to look into how to address these when we look at universities, a lot of them 
don't have integrated support. So for whatever reason, academic stress is treated differently than other psychological problems. Students often have to go to different places to get different resources. And the onus is usually on them. There are long wait times for appointments. There's a lack of long-term relationship building between students and therapists. And even though it's two years into the pandemic, uh, the migration to online services has been really slow. And there's a lack of comprehensive mental health education. Going through high school, I didn't have any resources at all besides a guidance counselor who would help you pick a university sometimes. But other than that, starting at a very young age, we don't have access to education or therapy that can kind of help us out. So realizing this is a problem, the solution is, uh, it, it sounds really simple, but it's very difficult to apply. We need to be able to provide integrative therapy to students that combines uh, academic strategies, psychological well-being, as well as career counseling. Because if a student fails a test and they start wondering what they're going to do with their entire life, that can lead to mental health problems. Uh, if a student is under a lot of pressure, that can lead to mental health problems. And if a student is depressed, that's going to lead to academic problems. There is really no point in separating out these specialties. So we need psychotherapists that can handle all of these modalities. And finally, we need a lot more mental health education because students and uh, people my age in the early 20s, they don't know how to manage uh, their mental health and how to uh, deal with stressors properly because it isn't really taught in school the same way math or science is taught. So what we do is we try to provide all-in-one support as well as affordable services and accessible resources for educators. Uh, and as we can see in the last little while, the funding for teletherapy has gone way up. So uh, even in the first quarter of 2021, uh, there's been uh, millions of, uh, billions of dollars in funding, and this is probably going to be much higher by the end of the year. But the problem with what's being funded is that even when we're putting all of this money into the problem, the problem continues to grow. A lot of the companies that are being uh, founded and that are receiving deals, they offer a lot of customized therapy and a lot of support and often involve machine learning and AI modalities. And that's the way uh, some aspects of the teletherapy field are going. Uh, what we kind of advocate for and as a counter thesis is that you don't necessarily need machine learning to help students find the ideal therapist. Instead, you need to get on the ground. You need to talk with the students, understand their needs, and build a system that can deliver that. Uh, so, so far we have a small team since we just started uh, a year ago. Uh, we have a good team of advisors. We've already started heavily on content creation and reaching out to different schools and universities, to the students themselves to build uh, grassroots networks and provide support. And uh, we're already taking clients and looking forward to growing over the next few years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Spichak. That was excellent. Um, we are going to collect questions from the audience. Uh, while we do that, I'll actually be engaging with each of the panelists, uh, asking some questions of my own. Um, but uh, please feel free to use that chat function, submit those questions to your host, and they will relay those questions to me. I can ask our speakers today. Um, but just to start off, 
Uh, it's really interesting, uh, Simon, that your talk was on this, uh, this focus on adolescence. And uh, I don't know if you knew this, but 55% of the people tested with the Genomine test are usually between the ages of 6 and 25. Right? People really don't want to go through those multiple medication failures with these children. And I think that uh, kind of what Dr. Patel referenced during her talk about the STAR-D trial and how the more medication trials the patient had, the less likely they were to achieve remission in the end. I, I think people want to get ahead of that nowadays. And so I guess my question to you and really to ask you, um, in this new environment with COVID, right, your people aren't able to get into their primary care provider or their psychiatrist, especially with all the access problems we have. Heck, it's that bad here in the U.S. as well. There's a nine-month waiting list for a lot of child and adolescent sites. How do we get them these tools? Obviously, you've, you've told us a lot about, you know, the teletherapy and these types of things, but what about PGX testing or evaluations that may need to be done in person? Uh, how's that been working, uh, at least from your perspective, uh, during this COVID uh, situation? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. I think, in a way, psychotherapy needs to work with pharmacogenetics to provide really effective therapies. But often, at least what I see uh, in Canada and also in the States, is usually people will go for the pharmacogenetic solutions uh, first off because there isn't a lot of knowledge about the access that people have to psychotherapy, either through their insurance or whatever is going on. So people might actually opt for the waiting list and try to find a psychiatrist. I don't know that a lot of people are aware of all of these tests, all, all of this testing either, but I think this is something that could be addressed early on. I think children, even as young as 14, 15, need to start learning about uh, mental health about depression, anxiety, which are really normal things. And I mean, with the way the world is now with the pandemic and with climate change, anxiety and depression is going to be inevitable at some point. So kids need to understand how to kind of deal with it. And I think that pharmacogenomic testing needs to be advertised more widely as something that might be normal, something that might be a part of your regular doctor's visit. Excellent. All right. Um, it looks like we do have some questions coming in. Um, I guess I would throw this probably to, um, let's see. The question is, what are some ethical limitations in personal, personalized psychology? And so I suppose that might also be to you. Uh, the, the, the question itself wasn't specific to pharmacogenomics, but certainly, right, we can, we can get your input from a couple of different panelists here. Um, who would prefer to start with uh, th that question? Yeah, I can start off. Yep. So uh, in terms of dealing with ethics, there's a few different things that we need to look at. So in Canada, there's a lot of people that speak uh, different languages. So if we want to provide equitable access to therapy, then we need to find psychotherapists that understand the culture and the language of a lot of the people in the regions that they'd be treating. Another uh, really important ethical consideration is looking at the regulations in every single region, how they differ, and how we want to hire uh, different psychotherapists, what kind of qualities we're looking for, and when we feel comfortable with uh, recommending people with certain modalities to seek psychotherapy. Something like obsessive compulsive disorder requires really specialized training. So, for example, we've been holding back on promoting OCD therapy as widely until we can find the appropriate psychotherapists that are able to deliver the modality. And another issue we're facing is that a lot of uh, companies that deal with mental health, like BetterHelp, which was recently in the news, 
they sell a lot of their user data and that's uh, part of the way they get uh, financing from different third parties and advertisers and that's definitely something you need to consider if you're going into business in the uh, in uh, 2021 we've had investors ask us about collecting big data and in our opinion it's completely not necessary and what we need to focus on instead is the patient and we need to make sure that our privacy policy and our terms and conditions are focused on protecting the patient first. All right. Um, um, I guess Dr. Amato, I can just tie in more into the ethics of uh, personalized medicine and psychiatry. I think one of the common questions that uh, we get is, you know, with sample testing, um, you know, what is done with the sample afterwards? And I think test any type of company that is um, having or using pharmacogenic testing should be really transparent with the consumer about what happens to the sample. And also, um, whenever they're signing any type of form or requisition form, there should be um, some type of indication on there, uh, you know, that I do not, I want my sample destroyed after uh, pharmacogenetics. So um, patients should always have that right. And I, again, I think it's about that level of transparency between companies and the consumer, because um, a lot of the direct to consumer testing companies, um, you know, they might be uh, selling again, some of the genetic information. There's obviously a lot of ethical concerns around that. And I think also um, in psychiatry, I haven't seen so much of a, um, ethics relationship with disease uh, gene associations because we're really not there yet. But um, I can imagine with fields like oncology um, where you might be getting early genetic testing done to see if you might have markers for cancer risk, uh, there might be some you know, ethical considerations there. But um, really uh, the field of psychiatry is not really quite there yet when it comes to um, predicting disease risk. Uh, so a lot of the ethical considerations about pharmacogenetics in general are quite limited. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, and they had a follow-up question. Um, essentially, it sounds very, very similar. Um, so I may choose another. Uh, basically, what's the role of digitalization in this field, uh, both for genetic testing and behavioral observations? And I think you guys uh, covered that. Uh, obviously, the, the more digitized data is, the more accessible it is. And I think as long as we're being ethical, uh, as long as we keep that data, you know, uh, from getting into the wrong hands, keep it, uh, keep it ethically uh, sound. I, I think that's obviously the way forward for the field. Um, I, I want to get into this conversation a little bit, so I'm going to ask uh, a little bit more practical question. Um, what's the type of criterion you and Dr. Markov use for choosing a patient for genetic testing? Right. I'm assuming you don't test every single patient that comes through the clinic uh, or through. What are the types of uh, patients you're looking for when you are going to use this genetic testing? Because we know that again, uh, it's it's not something that is going that may immediately benefit everyone, uh, but it certainly has uh, at least with the RCTs Dr. Patel has shown uh, some significance in treating patients who tend to have either one or more medication failures. What what, what specific criterion do you guys use, Dr. Useva? Yeah, thank you for this question, Dr. Ramato. Uh, first of all, um, I think the information that we give to the patients is very important because here in Bulgaria, this is not yet uh, um, a method that is so popular in the country. And I mean uh, by saying this not only among the patients, but also among the psychiatrists. Uh, it's not uh, very wide used in the practice, unfortunately. And uh, because we work together with Dr. Markov and uh, we are well known with uh, the privileges of doing this pharmacogenetic test, at least what we can do is uh, offer this possibility to the patients and inform them that a such method exists and it could be for their benefit. So, uh, as uh, for the criteria, how we choose the patients, of course, um, if there is a, a case that is um, uh, treatment uh, resistant, that uh, a patient was uh, already uh, pa has passed through many different options and lines of uh, 
of different medications, we can offer these tests, uh, perhaps to help further uh, with the choosing the right medication, but not only in this case. Uh, for example, I had uh, one very uh, one young woman, um, um, 20 years old, that um, she was brought uh, uh, by her mother to the to the uh, cabinet, and uh, she uh, just started. And uh, when we made the first trial with uh, medicine, and it was uh, uh, unsuccessive, uh, uh, and I offered this test to her, and so like that, um, the time uh, was shortened between the 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 giving the the medicine and the the upcoming results which was very important in this case for this uh, young woman. She didn't need to suffer more lines of uh, unsuccessful um, treating uh, procedures with medicine. Yeah. Excellent. And as kind of a follow up to that, uh, how do you feel the patients um, understand the results? Does it feel, is it validating for them, right? When they know that this may be the reason, right? That they might have failed several medications uh, or is it difficult for them to understand? Oh. I'm sorry, I had a little technical problem, I think. I couldn't hear the question. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. And it may have been me. Uh, I've been having some internet difficulties, so I'm sorry. The question I asked was as a follow up to what you were saying with uh, how this could be valuable, but it's limited in its usage. How do yeah. the patients respond to the testing? Is interpreting the results, uh, does it make sense to them? Do they find that the results are easy to interpret? Is it validating uh, for them to find out that there may have been genetic reasons for their medication failures? Yeah, absolutely. I think in most of the, in the cases, the, the patients, they, um, they really trust uh, the treat the doctor that is treating them, and uh, when the doctor is offering this opportunity, they uh, they collaborate. And uh, I think the interface, how it is presented, the results are not so difficult even for the patients to follow and to see why and how which medical medi medical is helping medicine is helping them which drug so. Uh, for now, I have no problems uh, as far as I can talk for my own patients that I was treating and, and I was helped by this test. I had no problems in communicating and explaining to them the results and why uh, we are choosing uh, this or that treatment for them. Excellent. All right. Um, let's see. So another question that we frequently receive. Um, people uh, have some misconceptions about pharmacogenomics. They ask us questions like, um, can these genetic variations that you test for, can they predict a disease state, right? Are these risk factors for uh, some diagnostic criterion? Uh, or, you know, is this the only thing I need to take into account? So now I'm gonna ask, uh, I'll start with Dr. Patel, uh, but I'm gonna ask both of you. Um, do you think that, patients understand the limitations and maybe uh, Dr. Patel, could you kind of go into a little bit of detail about exactly what genetics can and can't do uh, for the patient and what other factors they may need to consider when choosing an alternative medication strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the biggest things I referred to earlier too when I was um, talking through my presentation is that pharmacogenetics is uh, it's, it's probabilistic, it's not deterministic, meaning that, um, you know, anytime uh, you're getting pharmacogenetic test results, it's not going to ever identify the perfect drug for a patient. And it shouldn't if that's what it's trying to sell you on. It's just giving you probability estimates of response or risk. And I think whenever providers are using pharmacogenic testing, it's going to be important to be transparent with your patients about that, because obviously if that with some, most of them that maybe not coming from a science background, um, they might have preconceived notions. So I think being able to set those expectations, even before pharmacogenic testing is done, will be really important. Also um, reminding them that this isn't going to tell you that you have an increased risk of anxiety or depression or psychosis, right? Like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're really not there yet with psychiatry. Um, 
this is a whole separate topic really on that, but right now uh, there's a lot of kind of mixed results when it comes to disease um, gene associations uh, without looking at thousands and thousands of genetic variants. So um, I think that in addition to our transparency with patients, whenever uh, clinicians are looking at pharmacogenic test results, they should also recognize that when that should be combined with your clinical expertise, your understanding of the patient, all the training that you've had as a psychopharmacologist, but also understanding drug-drug interactions, right? Um, I talked a lot about those CYP enzymes and the drug metabolism, but a lot of people don't realize is that we can be born normal metabolizers of drugs, but if we're taking potent or strong drug inhibitors, that would make us convert um, essentially into a poor metabolizer, right? Uh, if we're using a strong inhibitor, for example, and that should be looked at too, because uh, you know, the gene drug interactions and drug drug interactions, environment interactions, is gonna give you a more complete assessment of, you know, appropriate and safe um, alternatives for your patients alongside using the uh, pharmacogenetic information. So, hope that answers that question. Uh, let um, Ruseva, <laughs> Ruseva uh, kind of follow up with that as well. Yeah, well said. Do you, uh, do you speak to your patients about the kind of the limitations and understanding what they should be expecting, Dr. Ruseva? Yeah, of course, it's very important to the patient to have a clear information on uh, what is about and that is gonna be performed on him or her. And uh, I give this information to the patient every time, and uh, I am trying to explain with details uh, how exactly it's going to help the process of uh, the treatment. And uh, that uh, for now, this is only ther for therapeutic uses and not for any prediction for uh, inheritance or whatever. Um, this we can only say by our. Uh, uh, our knowledge for now in psychiatry, which disorders uh, has um, um, genetical inheritances and what is the percentage as far as this concerned the patient. Of course, we can give this information separately, but it has not nothing to do with the, the, the test in this case. And for the testing, we only explain that this is going to give uh, and provide results uh, as far as it concerns the, the process of the treatment of the patient. Excellent. Um, I, I think that was well said as well. So now I think we're going to go ahead. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A section um, and I've run out of mine. Uh, obviously, we're going to finish up a little bit early, um, unfortunately, because of Mr. Shapov, he wasn't able to uh, give his section of the talk today. Um, but I, I really would like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for inviting us both here at Genomine, right, and uh, our other speakers today. And if, um, you know, you enjoyed the talk, uh, if you want to learn more, definitely feel free to reach out to us. I believe many of the speakers uh, have their contact information on their slides. I guess I'll have to ask the, uh, Theodora uh, if uh, they provide the, these talks after. Uh, but that's really everything that we have today for this particular panel. Thank you all for attending.